name is Bear Siragusa, and you are listening to the Hunting Hound Podcast presented by W Hunting Supply. Okay, it is May 1st. There's still about three feet of snow on the ground here. And I'm sitting here talking to two f- former guests and good people, uh, Samantha and Sam Natoli. Hey, good morning. How are you guys doing? Good morning. We're, doing we're good. We're good. good. And we're off. I'm better that there's no snow on the ground. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I'm over it at this point. I am. I'm over it. Like with, this time last year, actually about three weeks ago. This uh, last year, uh, we were already bare. It was already, you know, they were starting to spray the fields, and it was getting, you know, the lambs were out running on the fields and things like that. And right now we're, uh, yeah, still up to our necks in it. So I'm, I'm over it. But that's okay. I guess. Yeah. Uh, if the only thing you've got to complain about is the weather, you don't really have anything to complain about. Exactly. So, so Sam, so how what, was uh, was, how was your winter? The winter was uh, challenging. We had, uh, as usual, uh, poor conditions as far as snow. Mm. Uh, we had a successful season as far as harvest, but uh, it was very mm. picky. Um, when okay. you start taking out. Uh, when you start taking out the Sundays and you start taking out the snow days and the crust days, it doesn't right. leave you much of a bobcat season. Right. That makes sense. You know, that's that's tough, though. You know, it's <clears throat> how do you how are you able to do that? I mean, you you know, I've uh, there's a couple times here, actually not a couple times, often here in the spring. Well, I'll I'll end up doing something that's as close to dry land as I think it's possible on the snow. It's just, we're just kind of skating on top of this crust. There's no tracks anywhere that you can see. You're just kind of going off of going off of scent. Um, is that how you guys have to do it pretty much all year round in, in Maine that you've got those, you get those snowfall and you can get out there and kind of cut some tracks. But then after a few days, you're just kind of dry, dry grounding in a little bit. No, no. Actually, uh, what happens is normally once we start to have snow, usually around mid-December, mm. it pretty much stays. And uh, by checking the same areas over and over again, uh, we can tell, obviously, a fresh track that wasn't there the day before and sure. then hope for a fresh snow to cover up the mess and start all over again. Right. But scenting conditions, scenting conditions... Uh, are extremely challenging and as they get worse because of the lack of snow cover that we really need to effectively cat hunt here in Maine, um, it's it's brought me to a topic that we might want to discuss today, which is the uh, nose control of these hounds that we're using. Now, Mm -hmm. there's a couple of factors involved. One is, of course, hopefully... We're all breeding to bring out the best snow dogs that we can possibly develop. Mm-hmm. A dog that can run with his head up high, suck that, get that scent right up out of the air, run with his head back on any condition. Uh, normally speaking, and there are exceptions, the big hounds lack that ability in most cases. Mm-hmm. But beagles, on the other hand, Mm. have more of an ability to do that for a number of reasons. One, they have, they're closer to the ground sure. for one thing. They have more sensitive noses in my opinion, and they can handle a track that's a rabbit track. It right. is not like a bobcat or a bear. It's very definitive, infinite track, very, mm-hmm. very low scent, low scent. So, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've always started our dogs, our big hounds on rabbits. We do, we've done that since uh, the beginning of time. And now, uh, because of the number of factors, one, my age, one of, uh, things I'm starting to discover 
And getting back to my old roots, which were beagles initially, I have currently obtained beagles again. Really? Uh, That's really cool to hear. Yeah. That's really fun. Yeah. yeah. Beagles and are I, just and I live, the best. And I live two miles from the rabbit, man. Right. Because you live, last time you were on the podcast, you talked a little bit, we talked a little bit about pup puppies and you were talking about getting them started over was it bill bill doobie bill doob bill doobie correct that's yep. correct and, and um and, go ahead yeah so he's uh, he's just down the road from you yes my camp is 10 miles from doobie and my house is two miles from a local akc registered club where we're only able to run registered beagles okay so so with that in mind I wanted to discuss the difference between running in a pen and running in the wild. Sure. When you yeah. run a dog in the wild, you have a rabbit that's normally been unchallenged, let's say. So he's going to instinctively run in somewhat of a circle as a rule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a pen, the rabbits are tricksters. In a penned area, the rabbits have been run sometimes every day. In sure. some in some area in some areas they have a lot of pressure. So in order to survive, they've got to learn a lot of things, like how to escape, zigging mm. and zagging and backtracking and running the trails and running where human scent exists and a lot of different things, which makes it even more challenging for the dog. Right. So if you get into an, an area like Doobie's Pen where you can actually run your your dogs, you're going to be mm -hmm. running rabbits that are going to give you everything you need. They're going, to, they're going to have water. There's going to be a poor, sometimes poor snow conditions, ice, mm -hmm. everything that you can imagine. A lot of thick, heavy cover. And if you can get a dog that can work under those those conditions, what will happen is you, you should have yourself a pretty decent cat dog as far as being able. If he can track a rabbit and that's not, he's going to be able to track a cat. Right. Right. Wow. Now, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's, it seems like those rabbits are going to have, because they're, as you say, because they're being, you know, run every day, they're going to kind of put on a master class on how to get out of, get away from a hound. Exactly. So yeah. with the advent, with the advent of what we normally would do is we would start these puppies in a rabbit pen, first with mm -hmm. sight chases and then scent after that. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm introducing beagles into this situation so that these dogs can actually start tracking even sooner because the, the pup, instead of the, the puppy having to do it himself to start with, he get the aid of a beagle, which has a much more sensitive nose, in my opinion, and be able to run. You know, we have sure. a beagle plot hound cross right now that we call Jenny. And okay. little Jenny, 98% of the time when you take little Jenny out, regardless of conditions, She's going to drive a rabbit, almost checkless. Now, she's going to get checks here and there. Of course, they all do. But she can run under any condition, including solid ice conditions. So wow. when, you've got, when you've got crushed so hard that you can't see your own boot track, and she can run a rabbit and that stuff, you, you've got a nose. Sure. Now, because there's a beagle plot cross there, and her litter mates are also now cat. Her litter mates are actually cat dogs right now. They're, they're, the, the owners are using them exclusively for cats. Cool. Wow. For the same reasons we discussed, they can increase their season. If you can only go out a few times a winter because of snow conditions, imagine what would happen if you could increase that by double in using a dog that can track a cat like they track a rabbit. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean that makes that makes all kinds of sense, and it's 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 something that I, the only other person I've really heard talk a lot about it is is Becky Dwyer, who runs some of these dry ground things, uh, these dry ground lions out um, way out west, and she's done that. She's bred some be she's bred beagles into her dry ground lion dogs. Um, she and her her husband Cleve, and says that it's made it, it, it's made a a dog with just a, a a really really good ability to hold a line and run a line and 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 work through some really difficult conditions. Exactly, and and, hmm. and it's, my, it's only my considered opinion, that having done this for sixty years or more, that that beagle with a good nose, a good nosed beagle that really has the desire to run that track, 
is pretty hard to, to beat. He, mm. He's he's going to he's going to run a track that most dogs don't even know are there. Yep. Yep. No, yeah. it's not. There's not to say that there aren't plot hounds and other big game hounds that can't do it. They're, they're, they're coyote dogs. There's a lot of dogs with good noses, but the best noses as far as categories are going to come out of those beagles. Sure. Because I mean, I think that makes sense. It's necessary for them to have that kind of nose. Now, all, all beagles are not e- are not born equal. There, you know, there's there's beagles out there that uh, don't have the nose of that very very uh, exclusive dog. Yeah, one dog that can run under any conditions. That's what I like to see dogs being bred to. Something like that. Develop that mm. nose, and then yep. when you introduce that into your big game, your big game hounds like Becky had done. Now, you, now you're talking because now you've got the ability to fight a cat, you got the ability to treat a cat, you've got the stamina, and you've got the nose to go with it. And you got a little right. bit of size. If, if you were to cross them, we use our beagles primarily for the training of the big game hounds, but we also have dogs that are cross, plot, and beagle that do an excellent hmm. job. That's really, really interesting. How how long you said you got your start with the Beagles? Let's let's go back a little bit. I want to talk to you about a little bit about that. You say you got your start with the Beagles. How? T- tell me about that. Did well, your family about, have Beagles? Uh, a roundabout way they did. Yes, uh, we started. I started at about ten years old, so we're we're going. I'm seventy six now, so we're going back sixty six years. <laughs> I think was the first mm-hmm. time I heard a beagle run probably longer than both you and Samantha were alive combined. So, so yeah, the, the first time I heard a beagle bark, I was sold. I mean, he's coming home from school, and uh, little tall Jimmy Yerkenbrack said to me, so what are you doing after school, Sam? And I said, nothing. Why? He said, I'm gonna, I said, what are you going to do, Jimmy? I'm going to run my beagle. I said, what does that mean? I'm going to take it to the woods. It's going to bark, chase a rabbit. Really? Can I come? <laughs> yeah, I don't care. Come on. So I went with Jimmy. The dog barked once, and I don't know what happened in my brain, but it went south somewhere. And I've had dogs ever since. That's and awesome. uh, I had an uncle who I had an uncle who deer hunted, and a, and a dear friend whose father had a pack of beagles, Adirondack beagles, up in the Adirondack Mountains. And mm-hmm. uh, my friend liked to deer hunt, and I'd like to rabbit hunt. So I'd go with his father every chance I got. And he went with my uncle deer hunting. And that's gotcha. how I started with Beagle. <laughs> and then I had my own and uh, Adirondack, Wiederman's Red. And then when I was registered Beagles after that and beyond until I got out of the service. And then when I got out of the service, I had about 20 of them. And, mm-hmm. and, and I've been with them ever since. Came here to Maine as a young man in my early 20s and uh, joined the Beagle Club and became president of the Beagle Club for a number of years mm-hmm. and uh, ran competition Beagles along with Out in the Wild. We didn't have training uh, dates then we could run all the time and I did I ran okay 24 7 yeah day and night yeah mm. yeah okay. a lot of track time with them so I what, what it amounted to was it gave me the opportunity to see scent hounds at an early age over a long period of time and develop what I like to see in a scent hound I in mm. other words I don't like to just turn a dog loose and hear a bark I, I want to see what they're doing I want to see them on the line I want to see them driving that track. I want to have minimum losses. I want to see them running under all kinds of different conditions. In other words, technically, I want to see them do it right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's what I've strived for in both the Beagles and in the big game house. I gotcha. try to, I try to, to, to emulate what the, what the Beagles do in the big game house. Mm-hmm. And what I found over time is the, the find the ability to recognize nose because without Mm -hmm. that, you don't have anything. And when I say nose, I don't mean just the ability to go out there and bark on an old track. that has been there for a week. They Mm got to take this track and move it in a forward direction and only open their mouth when they got that track moving forward, whether it's a hot track or an old track and not babble and not backtrack. All these things are becoming, are, are technically incorrect. I, I look for babbling and eliminate. So those are not the dogs I want. I only want a track moving the right way, regardless of its age. And that's important because a lot of times these cat tracks are several days old. Right. And and I want, I want a hound that can take a track that's a couple of days old and move it. 
And they're right. very, very possibly that cat's laying in there 100 yards, 200 yards, a mile perhaps, on a, on a rabbit or a deer kill that he's got down. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to find a track every uh, every mile with a bobcat on it. So when you do find one, you got to have a you got to have a dog that can make it work, or you won't mm-hmm. get very many bobcats. Sure, sure. So, so um, because you have your dogs, you you have your your plots. You start them on you your cat dogs. You start them on rabbits, and you've started to use the beagles as. Um, sort of a, a, a gateway into the, the tracking and things like that with your big game dogs. Do you find that, that that ability, those abilities are partially learned or how, like how much, it seems like you're training for that as well as breeding for it. Like how much, yeah. what's the well, ratio no, there? Do you I, think? Don't, I, don't, I don't think, it is on my opinion again, that it's as much learned as it is uh, genetics. Okay. It, I, I think you have to have they have to be born with it, and then once they're born with it, it needs to be developed. The dog with the best nose in the world is useless unless he's got track time, right. whether it's a big game hound or a beagle. So by running the big game hounds with the beagles, they get an opportunity to get the track time in in the right way if it's run with the right beagle. In other sure. words, if that beagle is technically correct then that big game hound going with him is he's learning that process. But if he's, if he's, uh, if he lacks an ability, he's going to lack an ability no matter how much you run with that big one. Right. So you, yeah. you've got to have that. You've got to have that born into that big game hound to start with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the beagle's mm-hmm. going to help develop it by showing him how he's doing it. Right. So it, it may be a little bit, it may be 80, 20, maybe 20% learned and 80% genetics. But sure. It's sure, got to be in the. It's got to be in. The, it's got to be bred in the dog. Okay. Right. Just, you can't. A dog. A dog. If, if it. If a dog was up without breeding, it would be a poodle. You know. I mean, it would right. be. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know. And and you know, there's theories out there, and there have been studies I heard that have been made that all dogs have the same nose ability. It's whether they want to use it or not. I don't. That's baloney. It. That's. I, I, I don't. I don't believe that. That's. You know, that's you, baloney. You may have heard. Have you heard the same thing? I, I have, yeah. I, I read, um, mm-hmm. there's a very well-known dog geneticist and behavioralist who wrote a book called, I think it was just dogs, it was Raymond Coppinger. And um, he did a lot of studies uh, on uh, the genetic aspect of raising puppies. So he had different types of dogs. He had some bird dogs that he used, like some pointing bird dogs that he had. Then he had sled dogs. He had bur- border collies, and then he had livestock guardian dogs. And what he would do is he would have litters and then mix those litters and see how much of what they, you know, whether they, the border collies that were raised with the guard, you know, the bird dogs, whether they acted more like bird, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and found that... Um, almost exclusively that they were even if they'd been raised in a different manner they went back to type by the time they were mature and um but he did he did have a comment there that always irritated me because i liked the entire book apart from this comment was that he could he was sure that he could train a pekingese to herd sheep okay and that always drove me crazy because I, I don't I don't think that that's how it works. I mean, it's not my experience has been that you can certainly have a dog that can do multiple things. But, you know, if you take a beagle and try and t- train it to. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. You know, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's it, I, I agree and with you that so much of it has to be genetic. It has to be genetic. I mean. You know, if you and you know some of some of the more prominent beagler beaglers, they 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 developed like uh, there's a dog called Snowman, and mm-hmm. uh, just happens to be his name. And he was up here, and they did they they harvested like eighty rabbits with him one year. And uh, the, the idea was to find out what kind of a nose he had, and they ran you know daily on the poorest of conditions and shined at every turn in the road. But it was genetics that developed that nose. I mean, there, there's a one in a, a, a thousand dog right there that you would want to, you'd want to have something like that in your bloodline. And and there's other dogs that have been developed like that in the beagle world 
that will just have a super, super nose. That's what I like to see in the big dogs. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I have big dogs that I, I know for a fact, I believe they can't smell the track. I mean, if a two-day-old cat track on frozen snow, and yet they run it like they were looking at it. They, they've got something in that in that bloodline that, uh, that mm -hmm. that's working for them. And, sure. and, I, and, and we, as humans, have no idea. What is it? Are they sight chasing that cat track? Are they sight scenting it? Maybe getting a sure. little scent here and a little sight there. I don't know. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know that anybody will know exactly what they're doing. But when they can take that two-day-old cat track and run it like it was, they were looking at it. Uh, that, and, and I've got a young dog I call Angie, a young walker, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and she just, from the first cat track she ever stuck her nose in, she was a cat dog. Right. At, at be before she was a year old. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't trained. She, she had a few rabbit runs, but she really didn't care about rabbits. In fact, she read, she didn't even run them very well. She mm -hmm. would have a lot of losses, disinterest, the, dog, the beagles would be running. She'd come back out like, you know, then they'd okay. get a hot track. <laughs> go, they'd get it going really smoking again. Then she'd join the party for a while. And I'm going, yeah, you know, I don't know. But right. yeah, when I stuck her on that first cat track, away she went. Which now Sometimes. is contrary to everything I've always said. If they can't right. run a rabbit, I don't keep them for cats. Well, I'm glad I did it this time because she was the exception to my rule so far. I guess it was love it, love it first <laughs> sniff, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Have, yeah. Yeah. That, that's cool. And, and Ranger, uh, remember, you remember Ranger? We I do. The uh, National Cole or Cole's National Cat Hound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ranger, uh, he, when he was on, he was running, I put him on bear the first year when he was just a year old and he would come out. He would come out, he yep. would come out on the, come out on the bear. I mean, not necessarily afraid of it, just not interested. He would pop out. And I would mm -hmm. tell the client, I'd say, hey, we're running a bear. And they'd say, how do you know? I said, the ranger just came back to the truck. So we're, we're <laughs> cooking. We got a bear going. And that's how he was the first <laughs> That's how he was the first year. So when I was getting ready to kiss him goodbye, uh, maybe he'd make somebody a nice pet. Of course, the, the bear season ended. And we went on to the we went on the cat season and stuck his nose in the first cat track. And bingo, he was a cat dog. <laughs> sure. That, that's how it works. He, and then right. he's, he's seven years old now, or he'll be seven. And uh, he's uh, he's uh, he's amazing. He runs cats in the winter. He tracks tracks wounded deer and bear in the fall. And uh, yeah, I've and, seen that you know, you've been so, doing that. That's really really interesting. I, I really like that yeah. you're doing that because that's not a combination that I see a lot of people do um, no. outside of Scandinavia. Because that's nor like that's real normal here. A lot of people do that. A lot of people will use their hounds. Um, in the off season for tracking wounded game, um, but I, I know so few people who do that in the states. What made you? What made you want to do that? Well, a uh, couple of things. One, I started out with uh, in recent years. At any rate, I started out with bears that were wounded off the of baits. Mm. So if the bear, would, I'd get a call. Hey, you know, you've got bear dogs, and uh, we wounded this bear. Can you come out and maybe find them? And and I would. And of mm. course, uh, prior to the dog season in Maine, you could, if during the bait season only, which is, comes first for the first two weeks, we have to keep the dog on a leash. And, and that's okay. So I, right. I, I brought, uh, I bring a dog over. And the next thing you know, I mean, I started years ago doing the, the blood trailing thing. And the first question people ask me is, well, what do you, what do you do, uh, when you're running, uh, cats or bears? I mean, don't, don't they run deer? No. They do not run deer. You could not make any of my blood trailing dogs run a deer. You can't make them run a deer. They absolutely will not run a deer. They only track the blood. Interesting. And wow. they track micro they track microscopic blood, hmm. which you and I won't see. Right. And then all of a sudden, as we as we progress down that blood trail, there'll be another. There'll be a, you're with the dog. Your dog's on a leash. Sure. And then all of a sudden, somebody on a little little stick will find, oh, yeah, there's a speck of blood right here. Yes, there yep. is. And, I'll, and I'll, leave, I'll leave a piece of toilet paper there. I'll put it okay. on a branch. Oh, that's and smart. the reason smart, being, smart, smart. the reason being, smart. and I don't ever have to do this as a rule with Ranger, is I may have to circle back to that spot if for some reason right. the dog gets off the blood. Right. But it's, it, it well, really doesn't happen that often. That's real smart because there's uh, – 
I find this like loggers tape, this loggers ribbon all over the place because yeah. that's what people use here. And it's, I mean, it's there for the next 50 years, you know, it's going to be it's there forever. Yeah. Plastic, right. Toilet paper, so, biodegradable. You only care paper, about that day. It's small. You right, only care right. about that minute, that day, not Smart. forever. So you hang out. I'm going to remember, remember that one. <laughs> yeah. That's I learned one. it in Florida. I learned it in Florida, uh, tracking deer and hogs in Florida at night. Yep. Um, and this, this was even prior to GPSs. Because back when we were only using telemetry, the toilet paper was also a good way to find our way back out of the woods in the swamps. Right. <laughs> I can see and that. Absolutely. Had, and, and, and we never had to go back and get it. Right. Right. Yeah. So oh, it's, that, uh, that's smart. That's so a, people ask me all the time, why do you carry a half a roll of toilet paper in your back pocket? Well, there's two reasons. Right. One's for blood trailing. <laughs> one, one, one's for blood trailing. <laughs> but right. uh, but yeah and so that that's a that's a cool thing that uh, they won't run a deer uh and uh, of course they're all deer broke before i ever blood trail with them and right. uh sometimes sometimes uh you'll be you'll be blood trailing and uh a deer will jump up in front of you and run off and they'll and they'll say hey that that's not the deer i shot that's a doe i shot at a buck well it doesn't matter that's just the deer that was laying in front of us it's right. got nothing to do with what we're doing. Right. Are you sure? And we'd go another 50 yards and there'd be more blood. Sure, sure, so sure. It's, wow. it, it's, not, it's good. It's rewarding to find that animal at the end of the, at the, end of the blood is. trail, which you, don't, yep. which you don't do all the time. There's no. There's a whole bunch of reasons why you don't. Hmm. Yeah. No, it's, one is uh, not, mortal, one, not mortally wounded. That's a biggie. Yep. Yep. And, yep. Then, you know, after, after a mile or so, you might want to say, hey. I've had one actually run in front of a video camera that the guy had out, and we watched the video. He went far from his truck, and he put the put the card in, and he swore he hit it right behind the front leg, right in the heart. Except yeah. for when we saw the video, the deer's leg was flopping back and forth where he really hit it. Okay, yeah. And it was, and then, what do we do now? I said we go home. It's all we right. get through now. Yeah, it's I a mean, Sunday. Yep. Yeah. Can't hunt on Sunday in Maine, so. No, that's yeah, but, that's rough. The because I mean that kind of stuff's going to happen, and I think the uh, you know it's it's not only encouraged here, but it's it's a requirement as a hunter here of any big game. So anything from a roe deer up to you know the red stags, the moose, um, you know the lynx, whatever. Uh, you have to. You are required to have a in writing contract with a blood trail, like a blood trailing um, team or a, a guy with a dog that's registered as a blood trailing dog. Interesting. Um, because you are required, if you shoot something, you are required to then use the next, I think it's three days. Like it's a long, it's a long time to, to find that animal. If it's until the, it is the responsibility of the blood trailing um, person to decide whether that animal is mortally wounded or, you know, what they would call, you know, um, yeah, uh, declared healthy, um, <clears throat> which is a is a really good thing to do because it definitely, I think, it definitely takes. It gives people that pause before they take that shot. It's like, do I want to spend the next three days out here looking for this thing? You know, it might make them take that I extra it, deep I breath. I think it's a good law. It's, it's a great law. I wish we had something like that here because what will happen here, somebody shoots uh, a deer and they, they, they I, I am on the state's uh, list of blood trailers. So I can mm -hmm. be contacted if they take that extra step and contact me, but they have no, they have no requirement that they have to. Sure. sure. So do you end up doing any uh, kind of traffic accident, uh, animal, you know, any animals getting hit by cars, that kind of thing, or is it mainly just hunters? Uh, no, just hunters. I've never been mm -hmm. called to an accident scene for that. Um, okay. Never. Interesting. Had. No, interesting. No, they just, this, I did not that I I don't believe it ever even happens. It might, but it's not to my knowledge. Okay, interesting. Yeah. 
Interesting. So, so tell me, tell me more about these, the, the beagles you've got now, are these, is this your own line of beagle that you've had going the entire time or what, what, what have you got going right now? No, this, these beagles come from a gentleman, uh, who, whose name is, uh, Mark Peterson. And, mm-hmm. uh, he said super beagles for forever. He's the, uh, he's the Danny Luke of beagles. I call him the Danny Luke of beagles. Okay. And, uh, and, and when I decided to join the Beagle Club, which is right here almost in my backyard, I, uh, I, I met a, ma- a man over there who said, listen, he said, I've got one of Mr. Peterson's Beagles, he says. And actually, he said, you know, Sam, he said, I've been visiting with you here. And I know you take good care of your hounds, your houndsmen. I've got five Beagles and my dog box holds four. So I always have to have one in the cab with me. Mm-hmm. He said, why don't you take, why don't you take one of them? <laughs> I can't take your dog. I said, I'm going to get back in the Beagle, but I can't take your dog. So mm. we talked for another couple hours. And next thing I knew, I left with, uh, I left with Whitey in the back of my truck in the dog box. And, oh. uh, he, he told me that what the dog didn't do. He says, uh, he doesn't have much of a nose. Uh, he swings to the outside on a pack and he cheats to try to get to the front. Uh, he's mm-hmm. not real fat. He's not real fast. And, uh, I said, well, let me, let me have a look at him. Let me let me let me play with him for a while, knowing that. He, and, he, and he gave me the dog. He didn't want any money. He wouldn't take any money. And and he, and he gave me the dog. I figured the worst case scenario, I can give the dog back. I know where he lives. I'll bring the dog. <laughs> right. <back>. So <laughs> right. I'll take the dog. I don't have one now, and I want to start doing this. And remember, from February twenty first till the first of July, I'm out of business. There's nothing I can run. I mean, I don't run coyotes. And, mm. and I, and my cat season ends February 21st. So it's, it's rabbits. That's all there is till the end of March or the Beagle Club anytime. Then I can run 24 seven. So sure. it gives me something to do. And normally in the spring, I like to have a young hound to work with. This was a young hound. He says, you know, he's always run with my pet. He said, that dog really should probably be run alone. I said, well, thanks, Bill. I'll see what I can do with him. I'll keep you posted. Mm-hmm. Huh? Well, let me tell you something. I took that dog out every day under the most severe, frozen, snowy, crusty, crappy conditions you can imagine, both mm-hmm. the doobie pen and out in the open. He's a super dog. He doesn't swing to the outside. He does bark every breath. He said he doesn't bark much. He barks every single breath. <laughs> He's cold nosed. He runs on solid crust. He's everything I was looking. He handles like a dream. If I if he gets out of pocket and I tone him and I've done it from six hundred yards away, he's back at my feet within seconds. Okay, wow. he's everything Great. anybody would want it in a in a dog. Hmm. Now, what happened? It wasn't any magic that I did, but what I did was I isolated him so he would run alone. Right. Once he got alone, he was just a tracking machine. I think I did a little short. Uh, didn't I, Sam? Uh, with I'd... with Whitey Whitey crossing the path at Doobie's Pen and. He just and then he jumped a brook and I mean this dog is amazing. Yeah, so, I saw I saw that video. You and I actually it's actually what got this podcast going was I watched okay. that video and, and sent you a message saying that I was psyched that you'd gotten back into Beagles. Okay, so that was Whitey. I mean, you know, gotcha. if you watch the, if you and when you watch the rabbit, how he come out, and you watch the dog the way he came out, and you watch the mm-hmm. bark, he everything you would want in a beagle. And I and and I kept telling this guy, you know, this dog's amazing, you know. Yeah, yeah, but he doesn't bark much. He barks every breath. He needed to be alone. He needed to be alone because in the same way you run dogs with other dogs to help along, you have to isolate them. And that way you have a pack of leaders. You don't have a pack of followers. Right. So a dog a dog that runs alone all the time, I, I got a ratio a guy gave me once that I've lived by. It's five times alone and one time in a pack. They're yeah. pack dogs. They want to be in a pack, but they also need that individuality to run by themselves in my opinion in in my opinion totally totally agree with that and you know that's something that's kind of forced on us over here because we you know there's only a tradition for really wanting running the one hound at a time um even with beagles and you can uh, only run you can only run one we can technically some places you can run two but for the very, very most part here in, uh, like here where I live, it's, it's actually in the laws that I can only run a single hound at one time, like at a huh. time. Yep. That's interesting. That's interesting. 
So all so, of the, so e- like even the guys over in Sweden that run these big brown bears with their plots, they're running two, two plots on a big, big brown bear. Okay. So uh, you know, and that's okay. That's okay. Oh, it's, I, I, I don't think it matters whether you've got two or 22, the brown bear wants to do a number on him. He's going to. Right. So, and, and my philosophy has always been that any two of my big game hounds should be able to treat that by themselves. Mm-hmm. Any two, any combination of the two. Mm-hmm. And that's what I look for. Does that, do I always have that? No, that's what I, that's what I keep working towards. That's that the goal. Any, sure. Any paradox. That way I can grab two today, two or one's injured, one needs a rest, whatever the case may be. I always right. have a pack of two. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, so getting back to Whitey for a minute, the, the, the rabbit season closed at the end of March. Then I started running him in the pen. By the time I had him a month, he had muscles growing out of muscles in his back leg. He looked like a female. He looked like a female bodybuilder, Sam. You, you'd have been proud of him. I mean, <laughs> this, you know, rib, ribs just barely showing, striations. I mean, this dog was yeah. uh, just like a super dog. So anyway, lean and mean. During the during this course of uh, events, and once I saw what Whitey does, I wanted to meet this Mister Peterson myself. Mm-hmm. So I went to his home and his kennel. And I sat there and I visited with him and I, I sat and visited with him for a long time. And he has a talk about border collies. He's got one at his house. And one time we went into the house, he said, you know, Sam, he says, uh, this dog's going to bark a lot, but don't be worried. He's not going to bite you. He's going to bark. Though. Don't don't worry about it. OK, we walk in the house. I walk in behind uh, Mark and the dog walks up to me and he sniffs my hand and I sit on the couch. He brings me over his ball. He jumps up on the couch. You never bark once. <laughs> so after visiting with me, Mr. Peterson says, hey, Sam, he says, you know something? That dog just told me a lot about you. Mm. He says, you don't know it, but that dog knows more than I do. He said, I want you to come back outside with me. We went outside. And he said, you see that dog right there? That's Whitey's aunt. It is. I go, it's a beautiful oh, wow. dog. He's, he said, yep. He says, that's his mother's sister. Full sister. Same litter. Cool. He said, I want you to have that dog. Now, wow. I, I don't want to take that dog, Mark. I can't. I can't really. No, I, I, I appreciate it. And thank you very much. But I can't take the dog. Yeah. Her name is Speck. You got to take her. OK. So I take Speck from his house. And because of medical issues, this dog hadn't been out for a long time. Mm. Like a year, like a year and been out to run. Mm. A little overweight, beautiful dog, but overweight. I took him right. I took her right directly from his house to a 50 acre rabbit pen. Mm. Directly put her on the ground. Within five minutes, she had a rabbit going and ran like she'd been doing it every day. That's <laughs> what? How, how does this happen to me? You know? Right. And I didn't. I didn't run her a real long time, maybe four miles, and sure. I picked her up. So you do what you needed her. to know. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's all I needed to know. And then I started mm-hmm. working with her every other day or so until I. And now, now we got Whitey and and and, uh, and uh, Spec, and that's so great. there's 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 a pair of them. And that and I still run them individually, the same mm-hmm. thing, same same way. And then together, separate right. and then together, separate and then together. And she's she's a nice dog. So that's really so cool. So there, there's wow. the blood. There's the blood, and it's all about the blood. And That's the truth. That, that brings me another brief point. I just registered Whitey today from his litter certificate, and I mm-hmm. did it online. And I, then I called AKC, and you know what they told me? They said, yeah, we got it all right here. You're good to go. And uh, we'll, have their, her, we'll have his registration and pedigree in the mail for you. You should have it by Wednesday. I said, what? I said, this isn't the AKC that I know in the past. You send in a registration paper and it take you two or three months. Right. <laughs> your, gran- your grandkids will get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, your grandkids will get absolutely. it. Absolutely. No, yeah. You'll have, you'll have it Wednesday. So technology has really uh, been a blessing wow. there. Wow. So that, that's crazy. That's the scoop. That's the scoop. That's, that's where we're at. That's yeah. exciting. Wow. Yeah. It's a cool, yeah. uh, it's cool that you're getting back into the beagles. The more, you know, the more, you know, I, when I got into hounds, it was with the big hounds. You know, the first hound I had was a was a, an American foxhound. She's asleep behind me. I'm surprised you can't hear her snoring. Um, and uh, you know, so the 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 big hounds are just, I'll, you know, I'll have big hounds for a long time, but I don't think I'll ever be without a beagle again. You know, they're just. Uh, I, I won't. No, 
I grew up with them and I just, I love them. They're just such fun dogs. They're, they're, they're good enough to be really fun to run, but they're sort of ridiculous enough. So you can never kind of start taking yourself too seriously when you're running, running beagles, you know, it's like, yeah, they're just, that's right. they're just yeah. all around fun. And, and my friend, you, you've seen some of the, some of the uh, videos of my friend, Ricky, mm-hmm. Rick, Rick's a rabbit hunter. There's a, he's a rabbit hunter. I mean, a hundred percent rabbit hunter. I, I make him go cat hunting, but he's a rabbit. Okay. <laughs> okay. And he and he rather he'd rather be running the rabbits with the beagle plot cross that he has, and he's had them for fifty years, mm-hmm. because he can hear the whole race, and he loves to hear a hounds run. Whereas right. our cat hunts and our bear hunts, sometimes you don't get to hear them that often, mm-hmm. or for very long. Right. But the rabbit dogs are right there within your hearing all the time. Right. And he loves that. So that's, I said, Rick, you're going to make a rabbit hunter out of me. And I don't bring a gun when I rabbit hunt. That that makes him mad. That, I love to hear him go too. And I always sure. tell him, you, you can't train a dog tomorrow with something that you killed today. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Wow, that's great. So when you... You know, we were talking about when we started talking about it. We, we you were talking about getting your your big game pups started a little bit earlier. With you know, instead of putting them on rabbits on their own and kind of letting them slowly work it out themselves, you put you, you'll start them with a beagle. Absolutely. Can you and, just, just and, describe that process? It sounds yeah, you know yeah yeah, yeah. the be- the beagles you know they're they're smaller they're slower. It's something that the pups can keep up with better. You know, and, and you're looking for that slower, steadier beagle to train that pup with. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have rabbits in the wild, uh, assuming it's training season, you're going to have rabbits in the wild that are popping out because that beagle's crossing, making these rabbits cross the road. So now these puppies got a nice fresh track or possibly sure. even a site, a sight chase. Mm-hmm. And that gets the juices flowing a lot earlier. So you take a three or four month old pup, three month old pup. There's no reason why that twelve week old puppy can't start on a rabbit. Right. Okay. Wow. And, That's... And, by, and by the time it's six or seven months old, it's ready for the big woods. Right. Right. Yeah, that makes all kinds of sense to me. You know, it's 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 a conversation I've had with a lot of people where we'll talk about starting pups, and you know, I. I'm definitely of the opinion that puppies deserve to be puppies. They they need to be treated like puppies. But to me, that doesn't mean just letting them do, you know, lie around and roughhouse at home. I'm still getting them out in the woods. I'm still doing a lot with them. There's a lot of learning going on there. I'm just not trying to actively get them to run, you know, lynx or fox or whatever it would be. You know, so what right, you're talking right. about is like, you know, is it's like kindergarten Fun. for Fun. big game hounds. Yeah, it's it's great. It, yeah, that's very uh, well. That's very well said. Uh, it's kindergarten for for little puppies. You know, it's fun. It's right. fun to chase. It's fun to chase what they were bred to chase. Game. They were they right. were they were they were born genetically. They're they're, they're predetermined to predisposed to run game and and mm. and uh just like we are to walk and talk and we don't wait till we're a year old or two years old to walk and talk we start doing that as soon as possible and that's right. a, that's what humans try to become what they're supposed to be and it's the same with dogs and 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 the more track time a dog has the better the dog's going to be in other words he's going to be as good as he can be as good as he can be may not be very good right. or it might be great or it might be right. great. I mean, all dogs are not created equal. That's why bitches have big litters. Right. Okay. Cause some of them are going to be exceptional. Some are going to be good. And some maybe not so good. The key right. of course, when in a breeding program is to always have as many good ones as possible by making the right crosses. And some mm-hmm. litters are all exceptional. So, in, in, this, in the same way, everything in our lives are different. The same is different in, in litters as well. Sure. You've got those, but, but you got to give them a chance. And the only way you can do it is to put them on the ground on game. And right. the game that you put them on is the kindergarten game, the rabbit, the right. lowly rabbit. Right. Okay, I you mean, don't, which you don't is... start them out. Don't put them on a bear. You put them on a rabbit. 
I know people who would, but uh, <laughs> their dogs don't tend to get that old. They don't get that old or they don't stay on bears very long because they right. got hurt when they were too young. Right. And yep. you see that you see that all the time. You know, a bear swipes a dog when it's six, seven months old. He may never run a bear again. Absolutely. So now you've raised this thing, you know, for what? Someone else to make a pet out of, I guess. Make a pet out of or worse. Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing is to let, let them have their due when they're little and you'll develop you'll develop good dogs. Right. Whether it's just for the dog itself, whether it's just for the beagle or just for the big game hound or a cross, mm-hmm. you know. And, and, and now uh, the other thing that comes into play at that stage of the game is handling. Now they've learned to come to the tone. They've mm-hmm. learned you. They've learned to ride in a truck. They've, mm-hmm. they've learned all sorts of things that you've exposed them to. The more things you expose a cat hound to, the better chances you are going to have of having a cat hound. Mm-hmm. He needs mm-hmm. exposure to everything. Mm-hmm. People, dogs, traffic, woods. Rain, snow, everything you can expose him to. And he doesn't learn it in the kennel. Nope. I totally, totally agree. Totally, totally agree. So rabbits are the answer. (laughs) That's, it's fascinating. It's something that I wish, I wish that we had here, because like here we don't have these rabbit pens. You can't find them here. Can't find rabbits or the house. Yeah. Or you can find, you can find rabbits or hair, but you can't find the pens. So you, okay. everything we run is going to be wild, and it's got to be within the the season. Which I see no can, no training season. Do they have a training no training season? season. Nothing. No, just kill. Just kill. Which is kind of a bummer, you know, because I, I, there, I was talking to an old uh, an old fellow up in up the valley a little bit who's had these Norwegian Dunker hounds, which is like the Norwegian there. It's the Norwegian hare hunting dog. Okay. Um, they look a lot like they're real heavy boned. They look a little bit like a like a real heavy boned harrier, like a big like a real big beagle. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, he was saying that you know, fifty years ago they had an island that they would all go to and run on. <laughs> Perfect. And it which sounded great, and then they uh, then they dammed the river and the island disappeared and. You know they haven't had anything since. So, since it hap- since it was something that was happening before, I'm I'm actively looking for a place to try and get something like that going again now because I see the value absolutely of of trying to get, um, you know, something that we can let our dogs, let our hounds work on during the summertime. Um, How long is your season? The season is not that long. The 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 hair season ends. Gosh, when does that end? I think our season is two or three months. Okay. So it's it's not not as long as I would like it to be, and it, it varies from place to place to place. Here in Gaustal, I believe it's about. I think it's three months. Wow! See, we start in July in the training wow. season, and we end in the at the end of March. Right. No, that's quite a. And, and when I, and by the way, whenever I mention the word rabbit, I mean hair. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have any, we don't have any cottontails up here where they're all hair. But yeah. I always just, it's a rabbit. You know, it's a rabbit. It's, yeah. I know what it's, you're talking it, about. It's yep. kind of like a joke in the Beagle Club. Somebody will say, Do you see any rabbits? Yeah, there were two. No, there weren't. Yeah. They're hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gotcha. So it's, you got to be careful, though, trying to catch it, you know. Yeah, but uh, it's a, it's a, it's a good sport. It's a lot of fun, and and the pen is an excellent excellent opportunity. I mean, that, can you have a pen? In, That's in, what I'm in trying to figure out because they've got some real, they're real touchy about some of this stuff. So I could make a pen. I could put rabbits in there. Nobody would resp- nobody would have any issues with that. But the minute I started running them with dogs, like if that if pe- it would get people thinking and kind of get the attention of the antis. Being a little bit like, yeah, I don't know, what kind of a life is that for a rat? You know, it's like ignoring the fact that they're not getting eaten by foxes and not getting, you know, that getting and they're getting fed by me. You know, it would be yeah, right, that, right. Now we those, we have feeders 
obviously we've got we've got feeders in there. We got five different mm-hmm. feeders. And we feed them rabbit pellets. Oh, sure. And, 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 and there's plenty of brush piles and covers and log piles and so forth. So they have plenty of cover. Mm-hmm. And Doobie's pen, he actually has an escape route where they can go into a sanctuary. He's got cement blocks along one side of his fence so that the holes are. And a rabbit can go through the hole and get into the sanctuary. Oh, cool! And get away and get away from the beagles. That's great. That's the, that's the beagle, brilliant. Beagles, yeah. yeah, the beagles can't fit through there, and uh, the rabbit can. And they've learned to go into that sanctuary. And oh, then at breeding at, wow. at, at breeding time, what he does is he closes up the holes so that the rabbits uh, that are in there can't come out, so they can have their young without mm-hmm. being interrupted by the dogs. Sure. So you know, that's so brilliant. probably. Probably hunters and dog people like yourself are more interested in the preservation of game than the people that are trying to protect game unknowingly against the people that really love what they're doing. Right. Oh, I, yeah. I, it's, a, it's absolutely the truth. You know, it's absolutely yeah. the truth. And, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it happens all the time in the States, but it happens here as well, where, you know, you'll get people who will, you know, start to who will hop on the bandwagon of trying to protect some keystone species, you know, some charismatic megafauna like wolves, you know, is always the big one. And then they end up in a situation where, you know, the, the, what we want, what the hunters want is we don't want to exterminate the wolves. That's not what we want. But when there's a problem wolf, we want to be able to take it out. Take. We want to be able to remove that animal from the population. But what's happened is instead of just letting them go, instead of giving the antis what they want and letting them go insane, you know, just breed and you can't take any of them, so the population has exploded. They've tried to find this middle road between the two parties, and what's happened is that you've they've limited the number of wolves to a degree that now every single wolf in Norway is descended from six individuals. Wow. There's such an inbreeding problem in the population because they're not letting enough new blood in to keep it healthy to because they don't want a bigger population, but they don't, they're not letting the population get big enough to keep it healthy. It's, it's this sort of catch-22 where they're trying to appease everybody and, you know, nobody's happy. <laughs> nobody's happy. You know, least of all the teethless you know, cancer ridden wolves that are being born, you know, it's, it's a, that's it's, a shame. It is a shame. It is a shame. It's like, but I, I am, I am glad we don't have any wolves in Maine, supposedly. Yeah. Supposedly. <laughs> well, they say that our, our coyotes have like 20% uh, yeah. wolf genes. Oh yeah. Now, for sure. But, and, and recently a extremely large coyote was uh, harvested like in the 70s. 475 pound glass. I mean, that's that's a wolf. That's a big, that, that's my a wolf. Friend, that my friend is a very very large coyote. That is a that is a very large coyote. I mean, but they. <laughs> I, I read about that in National Geographic on a plane years ago, where they had done a genetic study and found that the that once the wolves were exterminated, the sort of remainder of that population inbred with the with the coyotes. And you ended up with, you know, uh, like a brush wolf, which where they're saying that the coyotes up in like Maine, Minnesota, you know, Michigan, those places like that are going to are, I think it was 40 percent bigger than the coyotes you get down in like Texas and New Mexico and places like that. My first guiding brochure, my first guiding brochure back in the early 70s, Hmm. I advertised for brush wolves. Okay. Guided hunts for brush wolves. Okay. Cool. And wow. and, and, and then uh, a, a critter was killed back in 1956 on uh, Lower Spencer Lake Road. And two cat hunters, before it was killed, two cat hunters found this track going across the road. And they said, uh, boy, I'd like to see the fox that made that track. <laughs> and two weeks later, an unidentified animal was killed on that same road. And uh, they shipped it to the University of Maine, and it was uh, that's where the the word that was coined, coy dog. They they yeah. called it a cross. They called it a cross between a dog and a coyote. Of course, mm. it was a coyote. Sure. It was a coyote, pure and simple, because 
from that day forward, there's coyotes everywhere here. You can't drive down a road without finding a coyote track. Oh yeah. I mean, we, uh, they were, they were an issue, you know, it's been heck, it's been 20 years since I've lived, uh, lived in Stowe over there and, and, you know, they were an issue growing up. I remember our neighbors had coyotes run their, their Labradors into their yard and, you know, come into the, take chickens and things like that. You know, the, the, the packs were, the packs were substantial already then, you know, you already had, you know, packs with 15, 16 members and, you know, they're, they're tough customers, those northern yeah. coyotes. and they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're in urban areas or in the country. They're big yeah. woods. They're everywhere. Yeah. No, yeah. they're, uh, their, their lack of, and uh, that's one of the things that you see from this sort of lack of hunting sort of off on a tangent here. I don't know how we ended up here, but it's fun to talk about. Um, you know, that you see is that once you take away our ability to run these animals or hunt them, pursue them, they lose their fear. And they begin to, you know, they start to get a l- little bit too close. They become urbanized and they become to view domestic, you know, domestic pets, even little kids as prey. Absolutely. And, they're, you know, it's, they're terrible. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not good. It's why they, it's, um, it's why they've had so many mountain lion attacks out in California. Absolutely. Yes, they ended I'm 100% again. Yeah. You know, I went yeah. to two committee meetings in the past month that the legislators in Augusta, Maine here, about oh, wanting good. to limit the, uh, limit the hunting on coyotes. I mean, yeah. we want to protect the deer, but we want to limit the hunting on coyotes. Okay. It let me makes... run that, do that, run that by me again slowly so I can understand it. Right. And then usually at the end of the meeting, what I like to do, not, not to speak poorly of our legislators, I like to stand up at the, at the end of the meeting and say, listen, I don't have anything to say, but by the looks on your faces, I would like to answer any questions that you have. Because <laughs> I don't think you understood a word we said here and not the first word. You, you, you know, they went as far as during this the same session, they went as far as including the gray squirrel in the training season. Oh, uh, uh, the red squirrel in the training season. And, uh, so now they've got that a training was season on their uh, they, they want There was a bill that proposed to have a gray squirrel training season starting in July instead of just a hunting season. So okay. this guy said, I got a little dog and it's a squirrel dog and I've got a little boy and he wants to start hunting. Yeah, this all sounds good. Let's do that. So they, they, they added the gray squirrel to the training season. So it wasn't very long. Lady pops up and she says, how about the red squirrel? Right. Okay, they said, let's do the Red Squirrel too. <laughs> so far, everything was same. Then somebody said, how about a black squirrel or a flying squirrel? I mean, you see, it gets so uh, convoluted that you wonder what you're even doing there. Right, right, yeah. It's... I mean, it gets, it gets insane. It gets insane because nobody knows what they're talking about. But anyway, I got to tell you, it's been a great session. I'm yeah. going to close it now for two reasons. And um, one is I'm going to take uh, a ride with Whitey and see how that goes. And uh, and two, I'm sure Samantha's got a must have a uh, soccer practice to go to, don't you, Sam? <laughs> always something over here. It's always something. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. Yep. But this was fun. This was yeah. a ton of fun. I appreciate you both coming back on, and it's always a always a pleasure to talk to both both Sams and. I, uh, yeah, let's, let's do this again and, uh, yeah, enjoy your, enjoy the beagles. I'll do the same and we'll talk soon. Yeah. I'll keep you, I'll keep you posted on the progress with the beagles. Do, um, please do. Since, uh, Whitey, Whitey, Whitey and Speck would make, uh, see, and I don't want to get into line breeding right now, Mm -hmm. but because, uh, Speck is Whitey's aunt, that would make an excellent cross. Sure. And that that would keep the blood the same blood in the same blood in the same gene pool, and uh, that that'll see that that's down the road, you know, six months or a year. But sure, we'll look at that as time goes on and keep you posted. That's exciting. Please do. All right, guys. Y'all All right. Have a great day and God bless. <laughs>
It was great to Bye. talk to you guys. Bye, Thank Sammy. You again. Bye, Bear. Love you both. See you later. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Man, I love that sound.